it's, it's hard to get the frame rate correct. It's just a series of images, a lot of stills. <laughs> okay, so why don't we start by, uh, if you could just tell us, tell me your name, where we are, and what you do. Okay, um, my name is Roberto Schaefer, and we're in my house in Venice Beach, California. And uh, I'm a cinematographer. Okay. So, cinematography. So how did you get started on all of this? Uh, one of those long stories, but I'll make it as short as I can. I went to art school, uh, studied multimedia, it was called at the time. It was basically conceptual art, uh -huh. installation pieces and things like that. And uh, I used a lot of film and still photography in my work. And then uh, I graduated from college and kind of got out in the real world and was a ski salesman in a sporting goods shop, um, trying to make some money because it was hard to work as a working artist. And um, I ran into somebody who knew me from years ago and had, I had been in a, to a toy commercial when I was a kid and she said to me, what are you doing here in the store? And I said, I'm working selling skis. She says, don't you want to make movies? And I said, yeah, I do, but I don't know how to go about it. And she said, go see this guy. He was the director on that commercial you did, the cameraman on the commercial you did many years ago when you were 15. Says, I said, w why? He says, I'm sure he'll hire you. They, they always need people. And so I went in and got hired to start uh, working on the crew. It was a non-union studio and got start, hired to start working on the crew, doing everything, editing and assisting everybody, every, every department in New York. That was New York? In Westchester County, yeah. Okay. And so I worked on this non-union studio for uh, six months or a year and uh, then got out of it for a while and ended up back into it through another friend who I met who wanted somebody who was uh, who needed a camera assistant on a low budget movie and they heard through somebody that I had once done something with some cameras and so I got hired to go on this free low budget movie and um, things went really well and the guy said to me you know if you want to continue with this come to New York because this was up in Massachusetts and I moved to Cape Cod said, come to New York and I'll help you get started. And he kind of took me under his wing. And I worked for him for about six months, assisting him. And then he decided not to shoot anymore. He only wanted to write and direct. So he gave me all his clients and I started shooting all their stuff, which was basically news, feature news for, for Europe. Like for Swiss, German, Austrian, French, Italian, and uh, Dutch television. Ah. So was there, um, let me just check, this is all going around, yeah. Was there a, was there a big union issue? No, at the time there was there was two unions in in the, the states. There was the IA, which was the big union, and there was NABIT, which was the low budget union. And uh, there was a lot of non union work, especially all the TV stuff was non union. The TV, you know, foreign TV stuff. We were shooting this new stuff. Um, then I wanted to get into the NABIT union, and they were giving. It was open. You could go every four months or whatever, or six months. They give a test, and you can go. So I took classes for camera assistant and went to take the test. And uh, this was after doing a lot of independent work around New York and freelancing and just, you know, shooting news and various things. And um, what, what particular formats were you on? Uh, we were shooting 16, pretty okay. much everything. My friend who was who then decided not to shoot anymore let me use his camera. He had an Eclair, an ACL. So was this Workgate? Like into, into, into broadcast for a while? Uh, this was, uh, was mostly was dual system. So we were shooting, you know, 16 on a camera and then somebody else was recording sound on an Agra. Okay. Um, and then in those days, I don't even know what they, they didn't really have Telecine. It was, uh, yeah, it was really kinescope type of, however they were I transferring it. In the, in the UK, we were calling it wet gate. Wet gate? Because they literally washed it as it went through so that it, any scratches. Would yeah, well, we did, we had wet gate printing. Yeah. Which was, yeah, it was a liquid gate, right. which would take any scratches out. So we're yeah. talking photochemical. Yeah, right? yeah oh, total photochemical. Oh, there was nothing else then. It was only photochemical. Okay. That's when I started. So I took these classes and I, you know, courses and I tried to get into the union and the guy who was judging me failed me because I didn't load the Mitchell NC camera fast enough for him. Um, so I didn't get into the union. But at the same time, I started shooting a lot of stuff for Italian television. Um, for the Rye, doing news things with a friend of mine, we, a Swiss friend, a no, actually, he was Italian. We worked with a Swiss journalist. We shot a lot of stuff for Italy and for Switzerland, and they wanted video. So oh. we rented a Ikigami uh, HL79, 79. yeah, and a, you know, a, a U-Matic, 
and we had to have a high band pneumatic because in Europe yeah. they were using high band. We didn't even have that in the States, but we got a European high band PAL pneumatic, yeah. and uh, which was basically the difference between standard def and high def in those days. Yeah. I, well, actually, it was the difference between PAL and NTSC, I think, because the high band was like 525 and the low band was 425 lines. Uh -huh. um, and so we started shooting video also. We did a bunch of video and a bunch of film. And then... What um, was the attitude towards that medium? Towards the video at that time? Yeah. It was news gathering stuff. Okay. It was, you know, that and some artists were shooting some stuff. I had actually shot some video, half inch black and white video, reel to reel, back in art school. Some stuff, and I still have some of it here. I just can't look at it because there's no machines to look at it on. Um, but no, it, was, it wasn't really look, it wasn't looked down on in any sense. It, it was just, it was used for different things. You, you know, nobody would use it for entertainment purposes. I think it was even before porn started shooting on video because it wasn't mainstream enough. It wasn't, you know, the handheld VH, VHS cameras or anything. Um, and then at that time, I, I got an opportunity through work. I started producing and I spent five years producing commercials. And then I ended up, uh, being dissatisfied with producing. I didn't get the really the, the, the joy out of producing that I got out of shooting or creating art, making images. So Were I- you producing uh, in both video and film or just? Uh, just film and okay. 35. We're okay. producing TV commercials in 35. Shooting with uh, Mitchell BNCs, reflexed BNCs and with Airy 2Cs and then with the first Pellicle uh, video assist on the Aries oh, when yeah, they first yeah. made those. The handmade ones in the big blimps and all those things. And then uh, I met a girl, as so many stories start or end, uh, an Italian girl in Rome, I mean in, in New York who was from Rome, and she wanted to make movies. She went over to, came over to film school in New York and I met her and uh, one thing led to another and she asked me to shoot some short films for her, which I did, and then she went back to Rome and one day I got a phone call. Um, I've got some money from the Italian government to make a movie, would you come over and shoot it for me? And it was, timing was right. It was early, it was 1981. And I said, sure, why not? And I went over for figuring I'd be there for six months and I ended up just staying for 10 years and um, learning to be a cinematographer really in Rome, working, shooting. That first one was shot on an Aton. It was the first Aton that uh, the LTR-7 yeah. that Chinachita had just gotten yeah. um, with a set of Zeiss Super Speed Primes, one of which was stolen by the makeup man so he could get a heroin fix. And, after about the third day, the 12 millimeter was gone. And so was he. Um, and then uh, I just, you know, stayed in Rome and kept shooting and getting jobs. And, and I was the American, or the Americano. And so if, oh, you're American, you must know video. So I said, yeah, I know some video. And they wanted me to shoot like commercials. They were starting to shoot video. Video Assist was just starting when I left New York. Um, I said the commercial company that I worked for, we had never had Video Assist. We shot 35, was a BNC reflex or an Airy 2C, and the cameraman said, the director would say to the cameraman, did you get it, was it good? And he said, yes, you see it in the dailies the next day. That was it. Then Video Assist started to break through and they got a Airy 2C with the pellicle image and they had the, uh, a, a separate big Video Assist thing attached to the BNC, which was this whole crazy Philips camera rig and stuff. And, yeah. But it was just at the beginning, this, that was like 19, 79, yeah. somewhere around there. And that was about when, when I started, first saw Video Assist. And the dominance in the Italian scenario though, was it happening or not happening at that point? Video Assist? They were taking oh, them. I don't think there was any Video Assist. Right. Well, actually, no, let me think. The, uh, the Aton camera had a, had a Video Assist um, but built. Were, they were one of the original ones that, that put it into the, built it into the cameras. As a practitioner though, mm -hmm. you were, uh, Question, sorry, oh, sure. were, were you um, uh, in any way taking notice of that? Or was it a director's thing? Or, you know, what, what did it lie in the mix? Um, it was, I think it was so new that it, we're actually most of the productions that I was involved with in those days couldn't afford it. Right. And I don't think any of the commercials that I did in the early days in Rome or in Milano had video assist. I don't remember coming in until probably the mid 80s, really getting. Okay. Really getting, you know, so not starting an issue to. At the time. Yeah, it wasn't really an issue. Um, I did buy a steady cam in a used one, a very used one, in uh, 1985, I think, 
and I brought it over to Milano. So there, I mean, we had to have the video assist because the cameras, if they didn't have video, obviously Steadicam wouldn't work. So it was there and we were using them, but it wasn't like, it wasn't like the, yeah. the, the normal, you know, everyday thing like it is now. I mean, now if, if the video assist goes down, nobody will shoot. Or if the video assist is, they go like, how can we shoot? There's no video assist. And, you know, let's go, well, let's do it the old way. <laughs> So to, towards the end of that 10 years, though, you were saying that video was coming in in some kind of way? Yeah, well, when I, when I, I moved up to Milano um, around 84 because I, was the, 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 I couldn't get jobs in Rome as easily. I didn't have working papers. I was, you know, American. And, um, people would say to me, I did a couple of movies in Rome, and then they say, if you really want to work, go to Milano. They do commercials. You can get away without working papers. It's a one-day, two-day job, a three-day job, whatever. Bill it from the United States. It'll, nobody, everybody will look the other way. So I did that, and it really worked. So I got, started doing a lot of commercials there, both as an operator and a director of photography. But most of my director of photography jobs came because they said, oh, you're American, you, can, you must know video. And I had shot video in, in the States for what bit, so I said, sure, I know video, you know, as much as I knew anything. Um, so I started doing some commercials on video. They had a mixture. Some of the very, very low-budget commercials were done on video. But there's a back at this time. I remember. Is there not a background hum of Storaro messing around with messing? Around? They, with yeah, uh, there was with Antonioni working yeah. with High Definition. Yeah, he had done a film which I saw at the Venice Film Festival, Il Mistero de Overald, which was done on the old Sony HD, one of the first HD cameras. Which I then worked on the second generation one, which was oh. horrible, and I can't imagine how it was like to work on that first one, but. It was, you know, it was analog HD. Was you talking about the Philips 1250 line system or the I think, Japanese? No, I think it was. No, I think it was the Philips. Okay. I think it was. It was. It was a really rough one. It was analog. It was. It was uh, tubes. Yeah. It was, I mean, it was nothing digital about it. Yeah. Um, and the, I believe it was black and white. The Mr. de Oberwald was a mixture. He did black and white and color sort of with it. He did a lot of fooling around with, you know, electronic playing with colors and things, which was. When I saw it, I thought it would look very like childish, like like a kid got a new toy and was just playing with it, and not doing you know. I don't think it was just very not not advanced at the time. Yeah. But yes, it did exist, and they were starting to come up with those things. But it was pretty much you know hit and run. There wasn't very much of it. I know Peter Del Monte did also a, a high def film in those days called Julia and Julia. When, when was that? That know? must have been around. Let's see, I saw it at the Venice Film Festival. It must have been around. 84. Okay. Between Peter, 81 and 84, somewhere Peter around Wallen and Laura Mulvey did a thing called The Bad Sister. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, uh, Frank Zappa did 200 Motels. 200 Motels, right, of course. But that was standard def. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. That, was, that so, wasn't high def. Now, in terms of the film stocks you're working with yeah. at this time, um, what kind of speeds were you working with? Uh, 50 was okay. most. It was 70, 52 and 72, 54 was the main stock at the time, it was 50 ASA. Then I remember there was also Ektachrome. We shot some Ektachrome, it was 160 ASA. Then I remember the first new high-speed stuff came out, and it was probably, God, what was that? It wasn't even 500 at the time. I think it was a 250 ASA first came out. And then I remember the first 500 that I saw that came out that was pretty, I mean, there was a big difference in the grain. Yeah. In those days, between and in those days, also the 16 stocks and the 35 stocks were different chemicals. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So there was there was quite a pronounced difference between the two of them. So the po but one of the issues here is that the at the moment in time mm -hmm. when we're talking, there's a delight in the uh, advances coming in from film. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Absolutely. Okay. And the new lenses. I mean, they they came out with the besides the the lens that uh, the NASA lens that uh, Kubrick used on. Uh, with John John Alton was it not, not John Alton, um, Barry Lyndon. Uh, this is terrible. Sorry, I apologize. No, not you, I apologize. no, no I, I can't remember. No, John Alton was the guy who wrote that book. I'm thinking of the guy. It wasn't Jeffrey Unsworth. Was no, 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 no. He took over from Jeffrey Unsworth on an earlier film, I think, or it was the other way around. Jeffrey Unsworth took over from him. John Alcott. Ah, yeah. John Alcott, who shot Barry Lyndon, they had that yeah. famous candlelit scene that was shot with the .95. 0.75 NASA lens that was very very soft, but you know we're and the, the super speed lenses came out the 1.3s with the, the three bladed shutters, which were rough. But you know suddenly you could shoot at night, yeah. and uh, 
there was 500 ASA came out and you could push it a stop and it looked like golf balls, but you could get exposures and, and see things. So it was, it was, there was a lot of things going on in yeah. the film, in, in film development at the time. So where are we now? We're talking, uh, yeah. It was like uh, mid 80s, okay. I'd say. Okay. So, so there's, um, there's this, and, and the, the, one of the issues here that is the X, I had to phrase this, the, the, the aesthetics were easily achievable in the sense that you, your belief and your faith and your trust in the, mm -hmm. in the medium of film was delivering, I mean, what you see is what you get in a kind of way. Yeah? Right. So it was, we were still in that place where it was quite a happy place to be. When, well, we when, didn't have any choices really. I mean, any real choice. If you want to shoot something for projection, for, for mass consumption, film was the only way to go. And um, yeah, I mean, it was happy, it was good. We, we were getting most of the things that we wanted from it. You know, it's like, it definitely advanced way beyond that, the quality of the film stocks and, you know, the sensitivity and granularity and all of that. But uh, at the time, I think, you know, it's, and, and actually something to do with the, the types of stocks that were available then, the time were almost a little bit more choices than now because there was a pronounced difference between each stock and you really could make your choices depending on what look you wanted. And the Fuji and Kodak had very different looks and there were, there were grainy stocks and there were fine grain stocks and yes, they were tied into the speed of the film, but you know, you had lights and each, or you shoot out in daylight, there's, there's plenty of light uh, for the exposure. So, you know, you made your choices on the artistic look of how you wanted the, you know, the film quality to be. The color palette, the saturations, because we were doing, you know, there's no digital on the back end. It was all photochemical processing, and so you know the limits you have with photochemical when you're making a print is more cyan, more blue, you know, more yellow, more red. So was there in in the okay? So there's that, but like, was there any? Uh, I knew people at the time that were sort of saying, well, I'm when they were doing a bit of video, they would go, for, they would say, no, the way I'm going to think about this is that certain manufacturers are like stocks. You could get a look out of a, an Ikigami that you couldn't get out of a Sony, mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and all of that stuff. But at the same time, it seems to me what's coming up next in the mix, tell me if I'm wrong, is we've got scanner technology coming in, because then we're starting to, not digitize, but ingest the, right. the film image. And so mm -hmm. where are you... Where are you at that point? And where, where in the world are you at that uh, point? At that point, I think... You now I did some, some telecine work in Rome when, oh, I, okay. when I was finishing uh, some of the early stuff I did at Cinecitta. Uh, I did a YouTube video on shot on film, 35, and we scanned it into the, you know, it was a black and white image, so we weren't getting to all the coloriza colorization stuff, but um, to jump back for a few, I did some experimental color work in college with some uh, machinery that came out of the military that I got to my hands on through some film school and uh, special programs with Warner Brothers, summer things where these video quantizer was called where you could actually artificially put colors into video oh, okay. images and some really great stuff and I, I, then I transferred a lot of that onto film as my medium to keep them as, as movies. Um, but I did get to work with, uh, with, with, with those kind of images of, you know, telecine uh, in Rome and in Milano. Uh, they opened up some digital master places, they were called, there was the brand new telecines that were coming in, the new, the new um, I, at the time, I don't even know who made them, if they were Da Vinci or Philips or somebody was manufacturing these things. And, you know, you could do some tweaking and playing around with stuff. Not, nothing like, you know, where it is today uh, or how we're, where it even was 10 years ago. But they were still, you know, it was getting into that world of scanning and doing manipulation. Did you ever um, find yourself uh, not putting a filter on to convert the stock into daylight or mm -hmm. depending on whatever it was in uh, some kind of belief or hope or knowledge that the telecine would actually just take you across quite easy or were you always quite no i think i was i think i pretty much always would do the the filters to in the camera do to the change right it. Thing. yeah because it's <laughs> it's there's something that gets into the chemicals that yeah. it just it, it does where the the with the, the, the telecine couldn't quite get if there was it's like if there's no red there you can't bring the red out, yeah, yeah. you know? So it's, if everything is blue, everything is blue. You can go white with it, but yeah. you know, it's, it's still, you need that 
bass. And there's like um, this old guy, Hungarian guy I worked with many years ago in New York said, even if you're shooting, if you're shooting a, a room and it's going to be dark, you're shooting a scene, it's supposed to be black, you need to put some light in there to expose the crystals on the film to make black. Otherwise, it's just going to look gray. You're not going to get the proper yeah, yeah, yeah. exposure. I think yeah. I met the same guy. It wasn't yeah. the same nationality or exactly the same. Uh -huh, terms, right, the same yeah, guy. Yeah. 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 <laughs> okay. So, so what happens next in the in the mix? So we've sort of at the tail end of um, Italy. Mm -hmm. What happens for you now? Um, then, I was uh, happily shooting commercials and working on features and stuff in Italy, and uh, then my long time girlfriend and I broke up and the 90s were happening and the recession was happening in Italy and suddenly work really started to disappear and a friend of mine, a South African friend of mine who was a director, cameraman who I'd met in Italy, he had gone to the AFI and came to Italy and we started working together in Italy and then he moved to California to make it big and he called me and said, you know, what's going on? Why are you over there still? You got to get over here. Uh, we always talked about making it in Hollywood and you got to give it a try and so I said, you know what? And I got nothing going on here right now anyhow, so I packed up everything and said, I'm going to come over for a try and see what it's like. He says, but you got to give it more than six months. You can't just, you know. So I said, sure, okay, let's give it a year. And uh, I got here in just after the, uh, the riots in L.A., which were in April of 92, and I moved here in the end of May of 92. And everybody in Rome was saying, like, why are you, are you crazy You're moving to Los Angeles now? It's like, the place is riots. It's still smoking. And I said, you know what, I'll whatever. There's troubles everywhere, I'll give it a try. So I came over and uh, in the meantime I got myself an agent. I took a trip beforehand because I heard you have to have agents in Hollywood. So I came over with a reel of work that I'd done in Italy and brought it and found somebody here that was recommended to me. And she looked at my work and said, this is great, it's crazy, it's weird stuff, you know, it's, it'll never work in the American market, but I know that you've got talent, so, you know, we'll, we'll see what we can do. We can try to sell you. Uh, but I won't do it until you move here. So, yeah, yeah. so it was, I think I saw her the year before, so in 91. So in 92 I moved and uh, just started hitting the pavement. And it, it was slow going at the beginning, but I have to say I was actually really lucky, I think. I only spent about four months without a job before I started working. Pick something yeah. Strains film? Uh, music videos. Okay. And at the time, in the early 90s, this was 92, um, Commercials and music videos were non-union. Okay. Only features were union. Yeah. And I think Nabit was gone by then. And the reason, and I, I go back to where I said where I was going to get into Nabit and I didn't get, didn't pass the test because of what was going on. Then I moved to Italy and then my mom told me about three months after I moved to Italy that Nabit called and asked me if I wanted to join, that they were, you know, going to let me in. And she said, he doesn't need you anymore, you moved to Italy. So, <laughs> so I come back, there's no union work yeah. uh, in commercials or music videos, so I'm doing all this stuff non-union. I, I worked quite a bit doing commercials and music videos, mostly music videos at the beginning. Um, and then I think in, God, I don't think it was until 98 that most of the commercial companies did, signed with the IA to, do, uh, okay. to be union. So and, were the music videos in some kind of sense as a kind of research and development department of the imaging? Yes, it was in those days. It was really much the experimental, where you could you know try all sorts of new things, and you know you never had enough money to do things properly unless you were on a really big music video. But it was a chance to try things out and do weird things and have fun. And, and the directors and were well up. For directors sure. were totally up for you know crazy stuff, and 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 I had been doing music videos in London before when I was living in Italy. Uh -huh. um, I would go up to London um, once a month or so and um, shoot different music videos and get you know get to hone my craft a little bit more yeah. and it was pretty good because there were some good music videos being done there. Also, I did a few in, uh, in Italy too but they were much lower. This is very useful for uh, the working practices of each of these different countries mm -hmm. to try oh, to yeah. get your head around. Yeah, yeah, it was very different. Is it very true that uh, Italian crews just will not be quiet? Uh, in those days, no, it's true. In those days they wouldn't because there was no sound. They never recorded direct sound. Uh -huh. Only on television shows. It was all, you know, like, uh, when I, I did a f one of the first features in Italy that actually had live direct sound. And everybody's like, I don't understand this. Why are you doing it like this? And I don't know if you know that, that there's, it's not an anecdote, but it's a scene in, in um, the famous Truffaut film, Day for Night, where Valentina Cortese is acting in the film and Jean-Pierre Léaud is, no, Truffaut is the director, I think, in the, in the movie, actually. And they're trying to get uh, 
her to say her lines and she's, she's just, she can't remember her lines. And so she keeps posting papers up with her lines hidden behind you know, columns and everything, looking to read her lines. And finally she just goes, why can't you do it like, like we do it in Italy? We just say numbers and then you put in the words later. So I, it's true, I mean, it was the noisiest cruise in yeah. the world. Great cruise, but noisy. Yeah. And it is true also that we used to have really good long lunches with beer and wine at lunch and really good, oh, those were really good. good food. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so we're into, we're into the kind of music uh, promo world and commercials. So there's experimentation going on. Is there any crossover at any point with the, the video and film scenario? Um, still separate? No, there was a little bit, a little bit. Every once in a while you get a, a lower, and usually the budget had to do with it, a lower budget music video that they wanted to do on video. Or I, would, did, I did a couple of commercials and things on video where they wanted, because they wanted to use the, the video effects. And the Italians got really big into the video quant, not, what was it called, the video uh, squeeze zoom, they called it. Oh yeah, yeah. Do you know the yeah, squeeze zoom? Yeah, what yeah, was, yeah. It? Uh, there's the, the American word for it is the, uh, the, not the Chiron, I think Chiron made it. Yeah. But it was basically, you take the image and it would flip and you could do all these, you know, stupid cheap video effects with it. And they would just go crazy with it. They'd stick the, the image into it and they'd go like, <laughs> <laughs> the images are flipping like, non-stop yeah. so they love doing that kind of stuff and you know and changing doing like um, live chroma keying and that kind of stuff for so I'm getting some a cheap sense stuff in, in all of this there's a bit of you that's delighted at the uh the 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 experimental the experimentation of in things but at the same time uh, an adherence an uh, understanding of the need to do craft mm -hmm. in yeah terms of the aesthetics of the image yeah, yeah well i mean i, I i'm I'm a classicist in many ways, and you know that's how I went to art school. Was you learn the classics and you learn the basics, and then you go from there and you create what you want to create, and you take the rules and you adhere by the ones you want, and then the ones you don't want to go by you throw away. But at least you know the rules. Um, so in a sense, it's it's that's the way I approached my you know image making, and I like experimenting and I like trying different things. And as I said, even in art school, I was trying out these weird new video machines that were way way you know ahead of their time and stuff that I was doing uh, on two inch tape at local TV stations in, in uh, St. Louis that allowed us to experiment and do things. Did you, did you slit the tape with a razor blade? Were no, you, uh, no, that, that we never did. Stage of that. Oh really? You no. You stick it back together with a sticky tape. Right? No, we didn't do that. We did, uh, we did just stuff using their... their Quadruplex uh, editing. Yeah, yeah. Of, yeah, all that kind of stuff. And then we did, um, um, what was the other thing that we did? That was, oh, well, no, then when you got into Telecine, when that first started, and it was all analog Telecine, it was not digital stuff, so there was a tube. Basically, it was a tube shooting, a video camera shooting the film negative. Uh, but we would do, you know, all the diffusion. You wouldn't shoot diffusion on the camera. You'd put, like, t try out all these great different things, like stretch saran wrap in front of the lens right. and put, you know, like... Uh, fingernail shavings on a piece of scotch tape or whatever, you know, all these bizarre things. Everybody would come with, oh, you see that video, you know, how they did that, and they did that with, you know, yeah, yeah. yeah he stretched, uh, he stretched, uh, a used condom in front of the, you know, just yeah. the strangest, oddest whatever things. You yeah, whatever you could, to, to make it different and to try something new. And it was, everybody was open to trying, you know, great. Because there, there was a thing knocking around, at the point the film stocks got really good, I mean, wait, would you agree with a statement like, I'm just chucking this yeah. out there, that uh, the DP's job was to induce atmosphere by basically breaking down the the, the claret the no the uh, clinical nature mm -hmm. of, the, of the film image because it was so good and the lenses were so good. At one. Uh, it's more like I think it's more like that now is that the film stocks have gotten so grainless and so sharp and so clear and the lenses you know obviously you can get some master primes or ultra primes or any of these really super crisp sharp lenses. Um, that you know, you, you want to soften up or work and do things to the film, uh, underdevelop it or overdevelop it, or you know, push extra stops just to get some more character out of it. In those days, it, I, I don't think it was as much. That is just trying to find a unique look, okay. because that's how. So it's think ninety eight ish, are we? Uh, ninety eight, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I'm, I'm kind of looking for the, because the, the year 2000, it's kind of a, you know, ooh, it's a, it's a, it's a moment, isn't it? Um, there's a point at which somewhere in, in the mix where uh, 
it's not so much video, and it certainly isn't digital cinematography at this stage, but there's a kind of a, a beginning, the beginnings of the rumblings of what we're dealing with right now. Mm -hmm. There was the, the Sony system, which was coming out around 1999 or something. The, their HD cam system was beginning to, right. to bubble. Did you get involved? I got this? involved with Sony at an early, early time. I'm trying to remember what year it was. Um, it may it was somewhere around 96 to 98 somewhere in there with their early analog HD oh, camera was that 1125 which, I think it was 1125 oh, yeah, yeah and it had a horrible black and white viewfinder that had these like you could barely see focus in. I mean you could barely see the image it was this weird uh, tube thing that had lag and it was just it was almost impossible to watch but they were Sony hired uh, myself, they hired this director and myself and a few other people to, they wanted to make a short film that they could shoot on uh, HD, transfer to film yeah. to prove that you could shoot yeah, yeah. on the HD and, and distribute it on film. And it yeah. would look as good as if it was so on film, So the beginnings supposedly. of the kind of uh, electronic companies challenge to the photochemical yes. companies. Okay, so yeah. this is ninth, in it, late it was, 90s. It was late 90s. I don't remember the exact year. Okay, so you're doing a bit of testing around there. Yeah. So it's the beginning of the crossover mm -hmm. at that point. Yeah. yeah. So come like 2000 and early 2000s, what was going on for you then? Well, actually, even to step back a little yeah. bit, I think even in 98, 96, 98, I did an experimental feature film with Mark Forster, or I think it was our second picture that we did together. Um, we, again, had no money. The first one, we had no money. We shot on 16. Super okay. 16 with donated, you know, I don't know where the film stock even came from. Yeah, uh, but the this, the But yeah. the, uh, and it was, f no, actually it never got released. Okay. Never even got blown up. It didn't get released because there were, because of music rights. It had nothing to do with the film. Yeah, yeah. But it did, it won an award at the Slamdance Film Festival. And that was the only time it was ever shown because they never had the rights to actually show it. Um, but then the second film we did, we decided to shoot with mini DV. You know, the little, true, the, pat was it the, the, um, Panasonic camera, the, the F, was it the, the 100, the FD or PD100, yeah, yeah, or the PD150. And in those days there was a company cool. called Swiss Effects yeah, yeah. from Zurich. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, I forget the guy's name now, he was a really good guy, really nice people. And they were pushing that you could shoot on these little video cameras and it was mini DV, it wasn't even regular DV, um, mini DV, but we shot PAL. We yeah. got a PAL camera because it had yeah, more little, resolution yeah. and they would do a transform to film to blow it up to 35. Yeah. And we shot our first, our second feature on that camera doing a lot of experimentation and, you know, little handheld stuff and, I mean, just really going to town with it. And it was, uh, so it was, you know, it was part of that path of experimenting, but still using it to tell a dramatic story, written story, you know, still using it as, in a sense, as classic cinema. We weren't really, you know, we weren't doing experimental filmmaking at that time. I'd done a lot of that in school and I'd done on my own, but this was still narrative, narrative yeah. filmmaking, just using new media and, and you know, the, the crossovers of, I think it was the same year that uh, Michael Arada, was his name? Michael, not Arada, Michael, he became a Latino director, did a film that became a big was one of the early video to film crossovers called Chuck and Buck. It was the same year that he did. And it was that, that Panasonic, that PD-100, and then yeah. the PD-150. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I got involved in a lot of that stuff. And then in the mid, early 2000s, I started, you know, I was doing still feature work and commercials, and commercials were all 35. Occasionally you get something on 16. Music videos were mostly 35. No, they were mixed, 16 and 35. At that point, I don't remember doing any video for music commercials, for, for music videos, um, or commercials even here in California at that time. Um, but I was doing movies and we started doing 35. And I got lucky in 2001 with Monsters Ball, which we shot on 35. And so that kind of put me into the ranks of now accepted cameramen shooting 35 and doing a lot of commercials. and. So there was very little crossover at that time. Are you, are, you, uh, uh, are you the kind of DP that needs occasionally, all the time, or not at all, to look through the viewfinder? 
I'm the kind. Have, yeah. I'm the kind who 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 needs to look through the viewfinder all the time. Yes, there are although, <laughs> although I have. On at you know, a, a more more of late than. Before I used to operate all my own. Yeah. yeah. A camera. Yeah. Um, I would have a B camera, steady cam operator, or whatever. Uh, after that, but like on Monsters Ball, I operated everything. Yeah. Except for a couple of steady cam shots because I'd given up the steady cam at that point. Um, on Finding Neverland, I was a camera. Then when it came later on to a couple of other films like Kite Runner and those, I was B camera and, and such. But I, 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 to me, it's as much about the lighting as it is about framing and composition. Yeah. You know, composition is really important. Was the B camera work though to keep, not to keep your hand in, but to keep your hand on? Yeah. Thing? Yeah. It was also I just I just love operating. I yeah. love being on the camera and and to know that I. You know, I already had enough dealing with one person to make sure that they delivered the framing the way I wanted it. And I finally found an operator who I work with who's great, who does that. Does it, yeah. But I still have to, you know, I'm still very, you know, I'm like, pan a little left, pan a little, you know, yeah, frame yeah. a little. It's just, you know, it's personal taste. And, yeah. and, uh, um, and I didn't want to have to try to do that with two cameras, so, sure. you know. Sure. And I just like being. And a lot of directors I work with would say to me, you know, do you operate the camera? Because they like that too, having the direct relationship. Now it's very different. I know with, with in England, um, having worked there twice, it's this whole, you know, the, the lighting cameraman and the operator and where the operator has the direct discussions and framing and shots decisions with the director, which I, I don't understand, you know, how the DP could just walk away from that. It's, it's just a different way of well, it's a different, different way. Sometimes a bit of edge in that yeah. exchange, which yeah. is and not I, the best thing in yeah. the world. Yeah, and I know I ran into that edge all the time because I, you know, the, I suddenly see the director being cajoled by the cameraman, by the operator, who's saying, "Well, why don't you do that?" And I guess that's not the plan that I had for this. I don't want it to look like suddenly that. Suddenly, you're fighting yeah. your position, which yeah. is a drag. Yes. The first, yeah. Yes, it's it's a big drag. <laughs> yeah. Well, okay, so <laughs> we're still on. We're still on. I'm trying to. What I'm trying to go through here, though, though it's a personal tale, mm -hmm. um, is, is at some point to unstitch the, the digital cinematography, the, cinematic, the cinematography of the photochemical, but also the uh, cinematographic, which should be within both, mm -hmm. and try to put, because it's great, I mean, this, your, your history is actually pretty much the history of the media, as far as I can mm -hmm. understand, yeah. as it stands at the moment, and we're getting towards this rather complex space. We've got the, uh, you've got a little bit of a fight going on, like, you know, this thing about red is a stallion, right. which you've got to ride hard. The Alexa is, hey, that's a cute. <laughs> <laughs> How do you feel about all that stuff, just jumping forward? Uh, you know, I, I, my love is, is, the, is the film look. And, you know, for, for years that was actually a patented, copyrighted name of a company, Film Look, where they did transfers from video to film, and they said they could make it look like film. I never thought it should look the same, yeah. digital or film. They're two different things, and I, I mean, I appreciate digital cameras that can give me an image that can look more filmic, more film-like. Um, but they each have their own, you know, their own ups and downs, their own good and bad, their own qualities and, and, and feel. Um, and something you said earlier about, you know, when we were talking about film stocks, where you change film stock depending on the look that you want and this and that, and. Uh, the, uh, you know, nowadays producers say, well, you know, you can choose your camera, the, the digital cameras for the different look. And a lot of the, a lot of the uh, manufacturers are saying that too. And, but it's, it's not so easy when you're shooting a, a feature or a commercial to say, well, I need five different cameras. You have yeah. to rent five different cameras. When yeah. you're shooting film, it's like, okay, give me five different stocks. It's, who cares? Just the loader cares. I want to shoot, you know, I want this look to have this kind of feel, so now I have to get a red camera for that. And then I want this, and I have to get a Panasonic Varicam. Then I want to have this, so now I have to have, you know, a, a, oh, yeah. a GoPro or whatever and to mix it all up. And yes, you can do it, but it's, it's, it's a lot more complicated in getting all those different looks and the feels that you want. Could you get, I mean, I kind of know the answer to this because it's a stupid question to even ask you this, but I know, let me make a statement. Sure. I know you can get a red look out of an Alexa and an Alexa look out of a red because it's a, there's a ubiquitousness to the digital cinematographic thing mm -hmm. that should enable you to, because you're the artist in the mix, you're the, the puller in, in line of all this stuff. But you said something about the pros and cons of the film thing and a digital thing. Would you say a little more about that? 
is your really do you st you still think it's not broken it's not gone it the, the the digital cinematography hasn't quite got there yet or do you think we've um i think it's it's about as close as it's going to be without actually being there you know it's almost an invisible line um with the newer cameras but that being said and it's it's not only the digital origination it's the di state to make the prints or go straight to a digital projection um, I still have never seen a DI and even the ones that I've done that I think look as good or as pleasing or as it's almost something it's, 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 it's something that's intangible it's something that you just feel when you see it um, that looks as good as a photochemical print okay. and if you originate on digital it's never going to get to that point of a full photochemical. If you originate on film, there's just a there's a there's a a texture, there's a patina, there's a, a something about the. And I don't even know what the word is to explain it, but there's something there that. And if you shoot on film and you go to scan the negative and make a DI, it never has the same feel or look that it does if it's photochemical. Now that's not to say that it's better or worse, it's just different. Okay. So I don't know that digital will ever replace the total film Thing. image <laughs> because it's, there's something in, inherent to me in digits and numbers and zeros and electrons floating around that's not the same as, as chemicals being changed by light. Um, so of choice on a movie, you've got that choice mm -hmm. and the studio is not hammering you, you're going to go film? I would say generally, as a generalization, yes, I would go film. There are times when the subject matter or the story or the look you want, digital, it leads, it lends itself to it just as much. I was going to say, if Michael Mann rings you up, he's going to... Oh, I have worked with Michael. Okay. I've cool. done, I did a TV pilot with him and I've done okay. some commercials with him. And the funny thing is, on the last... Um, movie he did in the last TV commercial I did with him, he was going to shoot film. At the last second he decided to shoot digital. Oh. The last TV show he did, he was going to shoot film and then they did some tests with the little Canon cameras and stuff because they were doing those horse racing stuff. And at the last second he decided to go digital again. Right. But he was riding the line back and forth a little bit more because you know, he was an early adopter with, with Collateral. Yeah, with, yeah, uh, yeah. I, mean, I, I did a TV pilot with him before Collateral, which he was basically doing as a test for the collateral theory uh, if it would work or not and uh, you know so I shot and I understood his I understood what he was trying to get at I understood why he used the video uh, the 900s for a collateral um, for the scene especially the outdoor night scenes in LA so because I said you know you can get that exposure with that same amount of light shooting film mm -hmm. it's you know it's a myth that you can't do it you can do it yeah, you can absolutely. get it yeah. but you don't have the depth of field because the 900 also had a smaller sensor, yeah. so you get more of the 16 depth of field, but it's finer, finer grain, um, at least at the time with the with the film stocks they had, and um, you get you know so you can get that deep. Yeah. Where you see Tom Cruise in the foreground, and you can identify the palm trees in the background at night. Yeah. Uh, so I you know I got it. I understood that. Um, and it depends on what the what the project is. You know, there's times when I think. So you're agnostic. Of the yeah, I think so. I mean, I'm shooting a lot more digital now than I, than I did, partly due to you get to the job, they call you and they say, hi, we've got a job, do you want to do it? And I say, what are you shooting? And they say, well, we're shooting. They rarely say, what do you want to shoot? It's usually, well, this one's budgeted for digital. Yeah. And I go, okay, uh, let me see what, we're, you know, what it's about. And if I, like the last film I did, we shot on Alexa. On, uh, on the big film stuff, yeah. on the, like, you know, the Bond thing. Yeah. Is there, I mean, I know that there were some Dorsas or Origins or? The Dalsa. We used the Dalsas. And Dave Stump locked together a bunch of. Yeah, we had eight cameras, but that was purely for one VFX sequence. Oh, okay. It was for a sky, the skydiving where they're falling, okay. free falling, because we wanted to do it where they could actually be falling and put the background in and, and work the characters together with actually using the real actors yeah. and not get into face replacement yeah. with. Uh, we had some stunt people in there also, but we also did it with the real actors. Um, like there was a movie that just came out earlier, The Bucket List, which had Robin Williams and, and uh, uh, Jack Nicholson, I think, falling 
skydiving. And you, it was so obvious that their faces were replaced. <laughs> and no, we didn't want to look stupid like that. So we came up with this, Kevin Haug, the VFX supervisor, came up yeah. with this thing to do, basically to rebuild our characters as full CG characters yeah. from high res yeah. digital imaging. So we had a, uh, there's a skydiving tube outside of London that yeah, yeah. two people can fully yeah. extend and float in. It's 140 mile an hour wind. It's an yeah. old uh, army installation kind of thing. And we shot, it was plexiglass walls, and so we put eight dalsas around and shot a full imaging of them floating, and then they used that to recreate the characters and make them move the way we wanted to and do what we wanted to in, yeah. for that sequence. But the rest of the film was shot all on film. But would you, at uh, any point... The new one is now... Shot and Roger's doing the new one on Alexa. Ah, okay. That was going to be... Uh, well, I was going to ask you if you would have... Because uh, he's, he's kind of... He's playing, isn't he? He's going across. Mm -hmm. But would, would you have um, replaced film in any way on that, on that shoot with an Alexa? Do you think that's a... On, on, on the Bond film? On the Bond film? No, I actually... I did test the first red one yeah uh with jim janard came over to london and yeah. we had a camera for a few days and did some testing and did some film outs and actually i was you know for some of the stuff i wanted to do for some of this um, stunt stuff I, I got some really good results i was really happy with it i saw the limitations where you know overexposure things would just go white and they were gone and i knew where i could use it or where i couldn't use it that was a political thing i wasn't allowed to use the camera because it was a sony film and they wouldn't allow any sure. red object <laughs> on, the, near, on right? the set. So uh, that didn't happen, but I, I understood it. And then I did shoot another film with the red one, which I had problems with because of the limitations of that camera and things that they said at the time that weren't really necessarily 100% true about underexposure and all that. Yeah. But the film came out pretty good. And I, the reason I decided to shoot that was, and I pushed them to shoot on digital, was because it was a film, Edward Norton was playing twin brothers. And there was tons of scenes where he has to be with himself. And, yeah, yeah. and for eye lines and different things, I said, if we have HD and we can have HD monitors, you can really see the eye lines and you can do compositing on set. It's going to make it go a lot faster and a lot easier for us. And it really helped. It, it did work. And the film was you know, pretty successful as far as that. You know, the look was mostly there. Um, have, have you used the F65 yet? I have not. I was going to do some testing with it, and I haven't gotten around to that because they didn't have one in the country at the point right. when I was available to do it. Um, I've seen the stuff that Curtis Clark shot yeah. on it, and uh, I'm not sure that I'm convinced about that I like the look. Okay. Um, and I think that's one thing where you said, you know, you can make an Alexa look like a red or a red look. I don't know that you can make anything look like a Sony. Sony, somehow, there's something, again, it's a textural or some feeling that I, I just... It's, if it's a hyper reality or something, I don't know. And the 4K doesn't help, I don't think, yeah. in that sense, because it's a very clean... In a, in a strange way, I mean, because film is, you know, is, is 8K, 35 millimeter, yeah. you know, if you have the proper scanner, if you want to get into that kind of resolution numbers. Um, but it still has a different, you know, look. I mean, then again, 65, you shoot 65 or IMAX, and it's incredibly crystal sharp, clear, real. It's the way you light things, the way, you know, the lenses, the way you deal with it. It's, you know, it can be changed. Um, so, so what's, what's going on? Why um, do you think that the Alexa is so loved as a, I, I as think, a gesture? Of I think the Alexa is loved because it's, it handles more like a film camera in the controls and the way the ergonomics are of it. Mm. It's, a, it's better balanced than the Reds ever were for hand-holding. Um, it's, um, it's, it's, it's simple in a sense. There's a few dials and things you can adjust and things, but you don't need to do that much to it. And the images, it's, a, it's got a good latitude, good you know, range, and it's, um, it's a pleasing image, whatever they do in their color science for their debayering or however it works. And I know that they have a double system that comes out of the, the chip. So you have, it's sort of like an HDR idea, but it's live and real time. Oh, so. It doesn't do double sampling like, it does, actually does double sampling as opposed to the red MX, which has the HDR function, which does a short exposure and a long exposure, and different, you know, so you, you sometimes have some temporal problems with that. Yes. Um, yeah. Whereas the Alexa simultaneously puts out two streams. One is your highlight 
to mid and one is your upper or highlight to lower mid and, and then upper mid to to shadow area and it combines that simultaneously. So what do you reckon stop wise you get out of um, I don't know, I sort of stopped bringing my meter to the sets anymore because I can't correlate my meter reading to the to the lens oh, anymore. Okay. It's uh, Sometimes it's perfectly right on and sometimes it's two stops off and I don't understand why. But uh, I, I'm guessing 11 to 11 and a half stops or something like that. But you're still, you're still measuring, doing a fundamental measurement. Aren't you? I, do, on I do measurement on set just for relativity between, okay. you know, my key to my shadow area or that okay. kind of stuff. But I don't use it to actually set the lens. Okay. When so I'm setting the lens now, I, I've learned how to read a waveform monitor. Oh, okay. and, I, waveform. and I try to, I know where, and like I, I shot film, um, I would shoot a color chart, the 3CP color chart, which is the best one that I found. Shoot that at the beginning of each lighting setup with my 18% gray exposed the way it should be. So now I take that 18% gray and instead of just shooting it and setting it for the telecine guy to set to, I shoot it and while I go into the DIT tent and I look at the waveform monitor, I make sure that the gray is at 18% is at the uh, 38, I think it is, three, 38 IRE or whatever. Now that's quite radical. Or 43 position. IRE. That's quite a radical position, it seems to me, to... Is that, is that um, part of the fact of coming across video early on and being comfortable in it? Right? It's no, still... no, it's actually part of the fear of the what they tell you of the what you see is what you get. Don't worry, if you see it on the monitor like that, it's because it's not always true. Oh. You know, you, you, you shoot something, you expose, you see on your monitor, you see one thing, and then you get back and you go into the, the post-production, you're trying to do it. And I said, well, wait a second, but that looks so great on the monitor. Yeah, but it's all, there's a lot of noise there. They, I said, why didn't I see it there? Well, I, you know, maybe the monitor was tweaked. Every monitor is different. They're all tweaked differently. You can't, the environment. So I don't trust that it looks good on that one monitor, but if I see on a waveform that something that I know is a standard, which is the 18% gray, mm. which is supposed to be, I think it's at, so if you hit that in the right If point. I hit that at 43% in when it's exposed properly, you know, I'll put up my, my light on it. Yeah. I'll measure that with a light meter. Yeah, yeah. And yes. see what the what it is, so I know what that reading is supposed to be, and then I'll set on the lens and I'll look and I'll see well if it's a quarter stop off or a half stop off. I'll adjust it so it's correct on the waveform. On, excuse me, correct on the waveform monitor, not correct to what the T stop on the aperture says. Do you think that that practice could ever get over into film? Um, well, I mean, I basically that's how I do it on film. Is I I, okay. I set the gray card up. You know, I use my meter and set what I think it's going to be, but then I still do the gray card and I expose for the gray card that 18% with, with a spot meter and set that up as the color t chart for the telecine guy then to set his balance at. Oh, but okay. I still then, you know, do my exposures with my spectra uh -huh. and, and Okay, all that. what's interesting about that is that the, because I was kind of meaning on set, but mm -hmm. a friend of mine who's a DI, well, he's actually a, he's probably, he calls himself a production supervisor now. They seem to change the names all the mm -hmm. time. But his line is, as soon as light hits the lens, it's post-production. <laughs> I know, you want to punch him, but... Yeah, really. <laughs> really. Well, that sounds like a production manager. But, or a production but, supervisor. Yeah, but yeah. the thing is, is, what you're saying is that um, in video, in a sense, the difference between video and film, as you've just characterized, it could be said to be that you're looking at the waveform monitor on set, mm -hmm. in one case, and you're looking at a waveform monitor in post, in the other case. Yeah. Yeah, in a sense, I'm just never there when they're looking at the waveform monitor in post. So I have to figure, you know, know that my reading is going to be... And I know also that when I read off my, with my light meter off the gray card and I'm shooting film and I set that stop on the camera from what I read from the, the, my meter, I know it's accurate. It's balanced to correct. For some reason, and it happened with the red cameras as well as the Alexa, I can be in a room like this and I can take my spectra and set it like this, do my exposure, read it and it'll say a T4, set it on the camera, it'll match perfectly. And then I can turn around and go over and shoot on that side of the room, use my meter the exact same way, get the reading that I think it should be where I want to set it, and set it at T4 and it's two stops overexposed. And I don't understand it. It's, I, it's a I mystery. Have, I, I, I know. <laughs> it's, it, that's a weird It used to be in the old days with the... Uh, because you wouldn't, you know, if you're trying to work at the ASA of a camera, you'd be uh, you'd be slipping in a, a color correction filter essentially inside the camera, which would cut down the how much light's coming mm -hmm. through. So it's an explainable yeah. position. Yeah. But this one, I absolutely. Yeah. So there are still mysteries in the, in oh, the yeah. digital. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I can't tell you how many times I walked out of the DIT tent on this last movie and just said, I don't understand this digital thing. If you, you come out here, I mean, I even do things like, you know, they have this false color on, yeah, on yeah. these cameras, yeah. which I have the chart from Ari, and it says right in the book that when it's pink, that's proper Caucasian exposure at exposure, at full exposure level, if you want it to be fully exposed properly. And then when it turns green, that's an 18% gray exposed properly. Yeah. So I'll take out my gray card, I put it up, I set it so the false color goes green. I look at the skin tones, because sometimes the DIT wasn't around and I had to set up something and figure the exposure on it. And I set the false color and I look and the skin tones are, in, they're in the right light, they should be exposed just at 100% properly. So I go and they, they turn pink, it looks good. And the DIT comes back out, he comes over, he goes to his tent, he comes out and he closes it down two stops, or opens it up two stops. And says, no, no, that's, it's, it's too, you're, you're, you're too much, in, it's gonna be, I go, but why doesn't the, and then other times, the false color is exactly what I said it, and he goes, oh, that's perfect. Yeah. So, I, and I say, look, you know, don't set that color on the, the IREs on that person's face to be like they're lit properly. I want them two stops under. You know, this is a, this is a dark scene. I want them two stops this under. This reminds me of old engineering conversations. Oh, yeah, oh, well, those were the, the, the old video days were crazy, where you'd be shooting something, the engineer would not allow you to shoot that. Yeah. They'd you know, no, you have to lift the too many, that's, that's not legal. Yeah. Yeah. Those levels aren't legal. And the red, oh no, you can't have that. You have to take, take two stops of light off the red, it's, it's illegal. So in, in amongst all of this, I mean, we, it's funny enough, we, believe it or not, we've been going for an hour, which wow. is amazing. No, because there's so much wow. in this. There's yeah. so much in this. But, um, okay, because we've got to draw to a close. And the crucial issue, of course, is in amongst all of that stuff, there you are with the full responsibility, effectively, no matter what anybody mm -hmm. else thinks. Yeah of the entire shoot, of the whole look, of the whole damn thing. And there, are in lack of, there is lack of dependable evidence at the moment that you need it. And yet, if you go to the photochemical, you're acting on a gesture of faith. Oh yeah, totally, yeah. So... And experience and, and trust that the lab is gonna do what the lab has done every other day for the last you know, 10 years that you've been working with them, that you know that if you turn something in exposed like this, this is what you're gonna get back, basically. Not perfectly, but in the ballpark. And to, to, to paraphrase Caleb Deschanel, who said in his ASC lifetime acceptance speech, lifetime award acceptance speech, he said, one of the wonderful things about shooting film is that you don't really know. It's, it's alchemy. You're never 100% sure what you're gonna get back. And the wonderful thing is those happy accidents or those moments where you get something back and it's better than you thought it was gonna be. It's more than you thought it was gonna be and it's like, wow, this is really incredible. You don't get that with digital because, not necessarily it's what you see is what you get, but you see basically close enough to your final image already on set and there's, the magic is kind of gone. You know, there's, is there safe, it's a safety net, but the magic is kind of gone. So, you know, it's, it's um, I don't know where's what's better. I know that I sleep a little easier at night or less sleepless nights shooting digital because I know within, you know, unless they lose the, the, the files, basically we shot something and I've checked with the DIT and I see the numbers are there. Basically we have what we have, it's there. It's not gonna suddenly show up, you know, well, why was everything three stops underexposed? We have to reshoot, which, only happened to me once in my career. I have to happily say, and it was it was something you couldn't reshoot because it was news, yeah. um, reversal film. Um, but it's it's um, you know it's I like the magic, <laughs> you know. And I'm not I'm not saying that I refuse to move into the digital age at all. You know, I just again I just shot another another movie, um, digital, and I know it's not going backwards. There will be many more digital. Um, but I've shot two movies in the last five, in the last three years, Super 16. One anamorphic with the Hawk anamorphic lenses and one scope, uh, one flat uh, to be anamorphic um, extracted from it. And there were reasons for doing those on film. You know, there's just a, a different look, a whole different feeling that I could never have gotten the way I wanted to um, on, on any digital format partly because one was supposed to look like it was shot in 1969.
and there's no way you're going to get that on digital. It just, you know, I mean, no, I won't say no way. You probably could in it with a lot, a lot of very expensive dicking around to make it. But why do that? You know, why not shoot something that you know you can do? It's there, it's in the camera, you shoot it right on, and it's, it's, it, it has the beauty and the, the, the texture and everything of what a film would have looked like shot in those days.